Welcome everyone to this special webinar event sponsored by Verisite. Novel genomic testing, improving diagnostic confidence for lung nodule and ILD diagnosis. Before we begin the lecture, a few housekeeping items for everyone. You all have joined in a listen only mode. If you have a question or a comment throughout Dr. Kerman's presentation, please use your question feature or the chat box located on your control panel. We will address all questions at the end of the lecture. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Jonathan Kerman. He is an interventional pulmonologist at the Medical School of Wisconsin. At this time, I'm gonna hand it over to him so he can get started. Dr. Kerman. Thanks so much for that kind introduction, Emily. Um, and thanks so much for um, having me uh, here tonight. I wanna thank um, Verisite and also uh, the folks um, at the SAB. Um, it's truly an honor. Um, so tonight, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, novel genomic testing um, and how it improves diagnostic confidence for both lung nodules as well as ILD diagnosis. Um, as Emily mentioned, uh, I'm a practicing interventional pulmonologist. I direct the program uh, at the Medical College of Wisconsin. We're a 700 or so bed um, um, academic medical center uh, with a very robust IP program. Um, and these are both tests. Um, that I have uh, used extensively um, for several years now uh, and have uh, really become uh, part of my standard of care practice. So here's the learning objectives uh, for this evening. We're going to review uh, the Percepta Genomic Sequencing Classifier, GSC, uh, its performance and how it fits into the lung cancer diagnosis protocol. Uh, then I want to uh, make sure that we understand how the Invisia genomic classifier works and its role in the diagnosis of ILD patients. And finally, we're going to discuss some case studies of Perceptive GSC as well as the Invisia classifier um, in practice. <clears throat> so these two tests both rely upon um, using RNA whole transcriptome sequencing and machine learning uh, to improve lung cancer and ILD diagnosis. Um, and first, we're going to focus on Percepta, which, which stratifies the risk of primary lung cancer uh, in the event of an inconclusive bronchoscopy. <clears throat> so this is one of my cases uh, that I first saw a couple years ago now. Um, a 54-year-old gentleman, um, he had an extensive smoking history, um, as well as a few other comorbidities. And he came to me uh, because of this right lower lobe uh, nodule that I think you can appreciate there. Um, and his question, as well as the referring provider's question was, is this cancer? <clears throat> so I was actually able to go back um, and dig up some old imaging um, going back um, uh, about eight years and found that this nodule was uh, present um, at that time, um, but was uh, significantly smaller. And so before he came to see me, he had already um, obtained a PET scan um, that showed a, a nodule in the right lower lobe just under two centimeters that had increased um, about six millimeters over a seven year period. Um, and the radiologist felt that this favored a benign process. Um, despite uh, that, um, the patient was concerned, uh, the referring provider was concerned, and he actually underwent a CT guided uh, biopsy um, that you can uh, see there, um, and then was subsequently sent to me. <clears throat> and, um, you know, the question was, um, listen, you know, this thing is enlarging. Um, uh, I know it's slow uh, growing, uh, but it is growing. Um, it's not inconsequential in terms of its size now. Um, I talked to him about how I think that this, you know, is, um, uh, you, you, you know, um, uh, likely benign, um, but uh, that, you know, the fact that it was growing um, did raise some concern. Uh, and ultimately, um, the patient was pretty anxious, uh, as I'm sure uh, we all experience. And uh, he he really advocated strongly uh, for proceeding um, with a secondary biopsy. <clears throat> and so um, we actually performed a navigational bronchoscopy on him. Um, which again uh, showed a benign bronchial epithelial cells. <clears throat> the other thing that we did um, at the beginning of the case, um, as we do in all of our lung nodule uh, cases, 
um, is we collected uh, uh, two brushings from the from the right main stem bronchus uh, for percepta analysis, and this um, reclassified his pre-bronchoscopy risk from intermediate uh, to low risk in conjunction with the negative navigational biopsy result uh, and uh, the low uh, perceptor reclassification uh, risk result. Um, after a shared decision-making discussion, this patient felt reassured um, and um, agreed uh, to continued surveillance um, as opposed to proceeding with, um, with a surgical biopsy. Uh, and so here's his latest CT scan. Um, the nodule has remained stable um, uh, since the last imaging um, about a year ago. Uh, and um, and uh, uh, the patient uh, is okay now. Uh, and so, you know, this was a case um, where uh, Percepta um, provided you know, a conclusive kind of quantifiable data point uh, that the patient was able to appreciate uh, and help them in uh, their decision-making process um, along with myself. And so, as I mentioned, um, Percepta is very easy to collect. Uh, it's simply two brushings uh, from the normal mucosa in the right main stem bronchus. Uh, it probably takes me about uh, 30 seconds to do uh, at the beginning of, of, of my navigational bronchoscopy cases. Um, and uh, we have it built into our workflow uh, so that when my respiratory therapists who assist with my cases see that we're doing a navigational bronchoscopy, they have the perceptive kit out and ready to go. Uh, and it's collected as part of the standard of, of, of care in all patients who qualify for it um, at the beginning of the case. In order to qualify for it, you simply have to be an adult over the age of 21, um, which the vast majority of my patients are. Uh, you have to be a current or former smoker, and all that that means is greater than 100 cigarettes in a lifetime. So uh, that's a pretty low threshold. Um, and you can't have any concurrent or prior cancers. Um, so other than those uh, few factors, um, we do this on, on everyone who qualifies. Um, if we get a call uh, during the bronchoscopy on rapid on-site evaluation, ROSE, um, then the sample uh, is simply discarded. We don't process it. Um, otherwise, uh, it is uh, sent off um, to Verisite and, uh, and processed. <clears throat> so Percepta uh, GSC uh, works by detecting genomic changes, uh, and it uses that to determine the likelihood that a nodule is cancerous without actually needing to biopsy the nodule directly. Um, so it relies on something called the field of injury concept. Um, uh, and so it's able to, to, to risk stratify a patient um, just based off of uh, off of RNA collected um, in the right main stem bronchus, even if you're talking about a peripheral pulmonary nodule. And so, when you have a a nodule um, that you take for bronchoscopy, um, there is uh, a fair chance that it's going to be inconclusive. Uh, and I know that that many of you out there never have inconclusive bronchs, um, but that's not what the data supports. Um, even in the latest literature with the latest navigational technology, um, we're still talking about up to a quarter of cases that are inconclusive. And so what's historically been done um, is uh, these have been reflexively sent on uh, for more invasive biopsies. Uh, like transthoracic needle aspirations or surgical biopsies, often with the argument that, well, if it was concerning enough to pursue a bronchoscopy, um, then we're obligated to continue uh, um, uh, to biopsy it to try to obtain a definitive answer. Um, I would argue that that is an antiquated uh, way of thinking. Um, we shouldn't be doing things reflexively. Um, you, you know, now with tests like this, uh, that incorporate precision medicine, we're able to reclassify uh, the risk of malignancy um, postoperatively, and we should factor in those data uh, into the in, in, into the decision-making process. 
Um, and sometimes it can change management, uh, which is all right. Um, so, um, so Percepta can can group people into five different categories: very low risk, low risk, intermediate risk, high risk, and very high risk. <clears throat> so there's really strong data um, supporting uh, Percepta uh, that has been validated. Um, starting with the Aegis 1 and Aegis 2 trials published in the New England Journal of, of, of Medicine, um, which looked at over 270 patients, um, and it leveraged what's called microarray technology, utilizing 23 genes. And then, and then they moved away from trials into a large registry study um, that looked at the real-world clinical utility of this test um, to show its impact on patient management. And that really provided the samples um, and the validation for the development of the next generation classifier, uh, which is the GSC test that I'm focusing on. Um, and so the GSC test utilizes uh, what's called whole transcriptome RNA sequencing technology. Um, and uh, uh, again, this was clinically validated, um, combining all of the data from the Aegis 1, Aegis 2 trials, and the Perceptor Registry um, for over 400 patients. And so Perceptor GSC is nice because it can, again, stratify the risk of primary lung cancer to help you guide management after a bronchoscopy is non-diagnostic. Non <clears throat> and so it can take people from low risk to very low risk, uh, and from high risk to very high risk. And in the middle, it can take people that are in that intermediate bucket, the largest bucket, and reclassify them into either low risk or high risk. <clears throat> now, some might argue, um, you know, why you are doing a bronchoscopy on someone uh, who has a low risk of malignancy to begin with. Um, so, um, so, who cares if it goes from low risk to very low risk? Well, you know, we shouldn't be practicing paternalistic medicine. Um, there are patients out there, as I'm sure you all have in your practice, um, who perseverate um, if they have even a tiny nodule that's low risk. Um, it, uh, it It is psychologically tormenting uh, for them. And so, you know, sometimes uh, patient autonomy um, um, should should play a significant role, uh, not sometimes, most of the time. Uh, and so you, you, sometimes you are biopsying these people in the low risk, you know, bucket for reassurance. Um, and so that reclassification to a very low risk can be helpful in that it's very reassuring to those patients. <clears throat> Same thing in the high risk category. Um, some folks argue uh, you know, why don't you just go straight to a surgical biopsy um, 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 if it's resectable in the first place? Um, and, you, you know, that may be possible, but oftentimes, um, at least at my institutions, at my institution, uh, the surgeons will want confirmation. Um, we've really tried to get away from doing diagnostic surgical procedures. Um, when there is something that is low risk, like a bronchoscopy, um, that can provide a lot of information. Um, as well as concurrent mediastinal staging. <clears throat> and the nice thing about Percepta is that um, the data is very strong. Uh, you can see the negative predictive values and the positive predictive values here. Um, uh, so this is data uh, you can really rely upon to make clinical decisions. So this is what a report looks like um, when someone is reclassified from intermediate risk pre-bronchoscopy to low-risk post-bronchoscopy, the report looks exactly like this. Um, and I like that um, because my patients can understand it. They can see it and they can understand it. And it's a lot easier for them to understand this than to look at a CT image of a nodule um, or to listen to me describe um, some of the different risk factors or to talk about validated calculators. Um, this is clear, it's easy to interpret. Um, and patients appreciate that. So whenever we have our follow-up visits after non-diagnostic bronchoscopies, um, I actually take out uh, the one-page paper report 
Um, usually it's not a physical paper, I'm pulling it up on the screen um, and I'll show you um, how you do that in a little bit. Uh, and again, you're talking about a 91% negative predictive value, so very strong data here. Here's what a um, reclassification from intermediate risk to high risk looks like. Um, again, very clear, very easy to interpret uh, for patients. We already talked about how easy it is to collect um, two uh, brushing from the right main stem, bronchus, um, uh, normal mucosa. Um, the company even provides the brushes and then they provide the little collection container uh, that contains RNA Protect. It's just solution um, that stores uh, the brush um, and protects the RNA material. And again, you're doing this on adults who have smoked at least 100 cigarettes in their life and don't have a history of cancer. Um, that's it. So very easy to recall um, um, inclusion criteria. And then this is perhaps my favorite part. Um, the results are available pretty quickly um, and you can get them in a dedicated app on your phone. Um, that's actually what I use uh, during most of my clinic visits. Um, um, I just pull it up right there um, in the exam room. Um, and patients can see it and appreciate it. Um, and it's also available um, um, online uh, in their portal. Uh, and their portal is really nice uh, because you can see all of your uh, data in a global view um, and uh, it will show you um, how many patients have been reclassified. Uh, and so it gives you some idea of the impact that this is having on your practice. Uh, and here's my data. Um, I have a 42% um, overall reclassification rate, um, which is uh, pretty typical for this test. Um, so I've had uh, five patients be reclassified from low risk to very low risk. Um, I've had three patients go from intermediate risk to high risk, uh, and nine patients go from intermediate risk to low risk, um, as well as seven patients go to very high risk from high risk. Um, you know, the one that probably helps me the most um, is the intermediate reclassification group. Those people who go from intermediate to high risk, some of them may have been reluctant to undergo uh, any type of procedural test, even if it's diagnostic in nature. And so this can really help kind of get them um, um, over that hump uh, and get them to some type of diagnostic procedure uh, so that we can diagnose uh, probable lung cancer. And then the folks that are reclassified from intermediate risk to low risk, um, you know, in those folks, if we had been planning some type of invasive biopsy, even bronchoscopic, you know, at this point, um, I have a discussion with the patients that maybe, you know, we should backpedal here and, and surveillance may be a reasonable option. <clears throat> so just to summarize stuff, um, perceptive GSC stratifies the risk of primary lung cancer when our bronchoscopy is inconclusive. Um, it can improve the outcomes of lung cancer diagnostic bronchoscopies. And there's a lot of data um, supporting this test um, that can help build confidence in the results. Uh, despite the heterogeneity um, of lung cancer. Excuse me. <clears throat> so now let's move on to the Invisia um, genomic, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, to the Invisio Genomic Sequencing Classifier. And again, this detects genomic UIP patterns to improve ILD diagnostic and treatment confidence. <clears throat> so this is um, a summary of the algorithm proposed in the 2018 a um, ATS IPF Diagnosis Guidelines. <clears throat> <clears throat> and these guidelines recommended a surgical biopsy for folks that had either probable UIP, indeterminate UIP, or an alternative diagnosis uh, based on their high-resolution chest CT. Um, and the problem with this is that a surgical biopsy, especially in this patient population, is not a benign intervention. 
In elective cases, um, there's a 1.7% risk of mortality. And when you go to non-elective or emergent cases, that mortality rate jumps up to 16% in the literature. Um, and that's significant. Uh, and if there's something that we can do to avoid a surgical lung biopsy, um, I think it should be considered. Um, <clears throat> you know, in the next iteration of uh, of of these guidelines, um, I think that you're going to see the incorporation of uh, uh, of different precision medicine strategies like Invisia um, <clears throat> that will. Uh, um, suggest alternatives to surgical lung biopsies because they are available um, and they're actively being used by many ILT centers like ours. So when you talk about IPF, um, the critical factor is UIP um, because that really informs your prognosis. So UIP uh, can represent both a radiographic pattern as well as a path as well as a histologic pattern, <clears throat> and it is not synonymous with IPF. So you can have UIP patterns in other conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, HP, or other connective tissue disease. And when you do have a UIP pattern, regardless of whether it's with IPF or with RA. Um, or something else, it is going to confer a worse prognosis. So if you look at the graph on the right, you know, RA UIP is going to be worse in terms of prognosis and survival than, say, a connective tissue disease, NSIP. <clears throat> and so, you know, it, it is really important to identify the UIP uh, pattern um, um, early. Uh, because if you identify it early, you can potentially initiate um, immunosuppressive therapy or antifibrotic therapy. <clears throat> and Invisia is nice because it allows you to make this diagnosis without a surgical biopsy and the risk associated with that. <clears throat> and it does so um, with a high degree of confidence. <clears throat> And I'll get into the data here a little bit more in a second, but one of the themes that I'm going to emphasize uh, repeatedly um, throughout this section of the talk is that Invisia is complementary to all of the other elements that go into making an ILD diagnosis. Um, it's a piece of the puzzle, um, and it must be taken into context in conjunction with the clinical evaluation imaging, as well as the multidisciplinary discussion, which I cannot overstate. So how does Invisia work? Well, it's a classifier uh, that, as I mentioned, detects a genomic pattern of UIP using regular transbronchial biopsy samples. So um, we happen to use cupped uh, forceps. You can use whatever kind of forceps you like. Um, you use your own forceps that you use every day uh, for transbronchial biopsies. Um, as long as you can see the piece of, of tissue, um, it is large en enough uh, for this. Um, it doesn't have to be a, a very large biopsy. So just standard transbronchial biopsies. You collect three from the lower lobe and three from the upper lobe during a routine bronchoscopy. <clears throat> Those get put into RNA Protect as well and then they get shipped off to the company uh, and they undergo a single, a, a single whole transcriptome library from RNA pooled from the transbronchial biopsy samples and that's generated and sequenced. And then they have a locked Invisia classifier and that produces a binary result of either positive or negative for molecular U UIP. <clears throat> And so this is what the results look like. You're going to get either the image on the left-hand side of the screen or the image on the right-hand side of the screen. It's a one-page piece of paper. It's really easy. Um, again, it's something that any provider uh, can interpret, so I share this with my referring providers. And I also share this with the patients because they can appreciate it. <clears throat> and it also provides the performance metrics, um, just to remind folks of the high specificity of 91% and high sensitivity as well. <clears throat> oh, 
part of me. So let's talk about the validation for this too. Remember we had talked about the Aegis trials and the and 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 the real world real world clinical trial for Percepta. Well, there's also very very strong um, supporting data for Invisia. So there were two independent prospective clinical validation studies um, in which the Invisia classifier identified UIP with a combined 91% specificity compared to histopathology. And so the gray bars here represent the initial validation study. The light green bars in the middle represent the second validation study. And when you combine those two people, you had, or sorry, those two studies, you had almost 150 people total. Um, and again, that produced a specificity and a sensitivity of 91% and 63% respectively. <clears throat> um, a different study looked at um, the rate of UIP detection compared to histopathology using HRCT alone, and then when you added Invisia to it. <clears throat> and the detection of UIP alone based on HRCT was surprisingly low. Um, I think that when you get o o away from specialized centers with dedicated thoracic radiologists, um, many radiologists uh, don't call um, UIP very often um, on their read, uh, and uh, it is a, cha a, a challenging, di challenging diagnosis to make. <clears throat> and there's also, you know, the potential for it to not be as apparent radiographically as it is on a molecular uh, level. But when you combine Invisio with a high-resolution CT, you can double the sensitivity for UIP detection. Um, so, uh, you know, a tremendous improvement in sensitivity um, for this condition that, again, if you can diagnose it early, then you can treat it early and decrease some of the prognosis, so some of the poor prognosis uh, that it pretends. <clears throat> so the Invisia classifier is designed as a complement to HRCT and clinical factors, and again, leads to a more confident diagnosis of IPF and ILD prognosis. It's not used by itself, and it, it is used in conjunction with everything else. Um, it doesn't confer a clinical diagnosis by itself, um, you're going to want to take into account the clinical factors and the imaging findings, and then have a true multidisciplinary discussion incorporating all of the data points. Um, and again, this is what we do as standard of care at my institution. Um, we have we have three ILD physicians. Um, that's pretty much what they do. Um, uh, and we have a very uh, um, active thoracic radiology program. <clears throat> And so we bring all of these people together uh, for multidisciplinary discussions. Um, and I'll show the format that we use uh, because I think it's a good model. So um, we have uh, three or four slides that serve as our template that we use for our multidisciplinary ILD conference, which occurs on a monthly basis right now. Um, and it's all virtual. And so folks who want to submit uh, cases both internally and externally um, um, just simply use uh, this PowerPoint template. Um, again, it has kind of basic uh, patient um, background and physical exam findings, which are important. And then we get to the slide that really kind of contains the body uh, of, of information for this. Um, and as you can see um, in the middle row uh, on the right, uh, the pathology section um, contains Invisia uh, testing. This is part of our standard um, um, uh, data report when, when we're discussing the, these types of, of, of patients. Um, and again, Invisia is incorporated onto this uh, last slide as well, um, where we kind of summarize um, the pathology and the specimen grading, the Invisia result, um, and the clinical consensus diagnosis. Um, <clears throat> Here we are using um, Invisia, um, oftentimes in conjunction with cryobiopsy. Um, we are generally doing that um, um, upfront uh, concurrently, um, simply due to anesthesia availability. We don't have um, uh, the resources uh, to bring patients for multiple procedures, um, but 
in a um, ideal world, I would argue that you know Invisia should be done kind of upfront, and then if that is is um, uh, 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 negative and there's still um, concern uh, for some type of of significant ILD, you know, process, um, albeit a non-UIP one, you know, then you can advance onto a cryobiopsy or a or a surgical biopsy, both of which, of course, are more invasive and higher risk uh, than a simple transbronchial biopsy, which is all that's required for Invisia. Um, again, five total: three from the lower lobe and two from the upper lobe. And so, just to summarize things, <clears throat> um, Invisia um, uh, is designed uh, uh, to produce a more accurate ILD di di diagnosis um, and establishing a firm diagnosis and getting away from the concept of a working diagnosis is imperative um, and supported by guidelines. Um, the 2018 ATS guidelines really Again, strongly recommend getting away from this concept of having a working di di diagnosis. Um, you, you know, having a data point, uh, whether it's um, Invisia or a um, or, or or a biopsy uh, that actually demonstrates uh, the histology um, is important. <clears throat> um, it's so the in, so the Invisia classifier accurately de detects the genomic pattern of UIP without the need for histopathology, um, and with very high correlation to expert ILD histopathology results. And again, it's designed as a complement to high-resolution CT and clinical factors, and it increases confidence in IPF diagnosis and in ILD prognosis. Um, with that being said. I think that that concludes everything that I had. Um, I know uh, that you know I moved through a lot of information there, um, but I want to be respectful of uh, people's time. Um, so I tried to hit the highlights, um, but I'm happy to elaborate more on on my practice patterns uh, um, uh, and what we do at our center or other questions that folks have. Thank you, Dr. Kerman. Yes, um, we are going to open it up now to the audience and the attendees. Feel free to throw in any questions into that question feature that you have on your control panel, as well as in the chat box if necessary. I do have some questions coming in though, Dr. Kerman. Um, one is, how do you get your Percepta GSC and Visio results from Verisite? Sure, um, so uh, I get them in the uh, dedicated Verisite um, app on my phone. Um, it is really easy. Uh, it works with the Face ID function, so I literally don't even have to type in um, a password. Um, and uh, it is uh, clear and large, so my patients um, can see it right there in clinic. Uh, and I found that that's the easiest, most efficient way to access uh, my results. Um, when I want to see a nice overview of my, you know, whole center, um, that's when I log into the online portal, um, and I can use the dashboard to analyze my data uh, using a variety of different filters. Great, thank you. Another question is for the clinical case: How do you plan on continuing the follow-up surveillance? Um, so with that patient, um, I have offered um, um, a lot of reassurance. Uh, and uh, they absolutely loved uh, the Percepta uh, results. Um, you, you know, um, I think they probably had more faith um, in that kind of quantifiable uh, Percepta result uh, than the actual biopsy, um, which I've seen now a couple times from my patients. Um, patients love numbers. Um, they're always scared uh, that when you're biopsying in the lung, um, you know, you can miss because you're trying to hit a moving target. Um, and, and so that patient um, has agreed to undergo um, um, annual surveillance. I told him that we're doing that for a couple years and then he is home free um, after that. And again, uh, this is um, taking into account patient autonomy and their preferences. Um, uh, if they had simply deferred to me, um, which this patient didn't, um, I probably uh, uh, would have just um, stopped surveillance at this point uh, based on the biopsy results and the reassurance from Percepta.
All right, a follow-up question from the same person is, for Invisia testing, is this the current practice at your institution for all ILD, UIP suspected patient, and is the pathologist looking at the biopsy results that were done for Invisia? So, um, I'll answer the second part of that first. So, the Invisia biopsies, those go out to the company. They are not examined internally. Um, so, they are strictly for the um, for the test. Um, we take additional biopsies, um, not regular transbronchial biopsies, but but cryobiopsies uh, for use internally uh, by our dedicated lung pathologists. Um, and then, uh, sorry, Emily, what was the first part of that question? Yes, it was. Let me pull it back up for you. Thanks. It was for Invisia testing is the current practice at your institution. Do you remember it now? Yep, yep. Okay. So we use Invisia testing um, in all patients uh, in which we suspect a UIP pattern. And by suspect, I mean have a probable or indeterminate um, UIP pattern. If they have a definite UIP pattern, um, you know, we are making clinical decisions uh, based on that alone um, and not proceeding to some type of of um, of uh, uh, biopsy. Um, and if they have an alternative diagnosis, um, in general, we are uh, um, not using uh, the Invisia uh, classifier, but many of our patients uh, fit into that probable or indeterminate category. And so I would say that the majority of folks um, um, who are undergoing a procedure for ILD um, are having Invisia done. Um, and it's part, again, of our standard uh, reporting algorithm uh, for our multidisciplinary conference. And so uh, if it's not collected, um, the presenter will always speak to why uh, that was the case. Okay, great, thank you. Another question is, how will you work in nasal swab Percepta to your workup? Yeah, so uh, the nasal swab classifier um, is something that I didn't talk about. Uh, and uh, if folks are interested in that, they can certainly get more information on it um, from, uh, from the company. Um, but uh, that is something that is um, used on the front end um, as opposed to the back end like Percepta. Um, so it can uh, serve to reclassify the pretest probability of malignancy um, in a minimally invasive manner um, with a simple nasal swab um, as the name implies. Um, and so uh, uh, that's something that would be complementary um, to Percepta, albeit on the front end, uh, to decide if you even move forward um, with a bronchoscopy um, or some type of other biopsy in the first place. Thank you. Um, another question. Some physicians have put a patient on an antifibrotic based on a provisional diagnosis of IPF. Can you speak to this and your thoughts of getting a de definitive diagnosis up front? I think that um, if that can be avoided, um, it should be. Um, the idea of a working diagnosis, which is essentially empirically treating somebody um, that has uh, either a probable or an indeterminate UIP diagnosis um, is not ideal. And I think that in the past, um, we've kind of been forced to do that because the alternative was higher risk biopsies. But now that we can make a diagnosis with you know, a 91% you know, specificity um, just based off simple transbronchial biopsies. Um, you know, I, I think that the, that the scenario where we're treating empirically um, should be few and far between. Um, I think that the vast majority of patients, even those with UIP um, or suspected UIP can tolerate simple transbronchial biopsies. Um, they don't even need general anesthesia for that. Um, and, and so uh, with something like Invisia, uh, y you know, I can't think of of, um, of any patients at our own center that we're still treating empirically. Um, you know, patients that had been on antifibrotic therapy 
we're sometimes going back and kind of verifying the diagnosis using Invisia um, uh, uh, instead of just blindly moving forward. Great. The next question is, what is the number of biopsies for Invisia? Five, three from the lower lobe, two from the upper lobe, uh, one side, obviously. Um, and they don't have to be, you know, giant biopsies, just standard little like cupped forceps or whatever you're, 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 you're using for your standard uh, transbronchial biopsies. You don't have to do anything special. Um, Percepta is just a standard brushing um, uh, and Invisia is just standard transbronchial biopsies. So we are taking stuff that we're already acquiring um, and we're just um, analyzing it uh, based on the RNA involved. Um, so you're not doing anything that's higher risk than you would do normally, which is really nice. Great, and then we have two last questions. How do you decide which bronchoscopy patients will be using Percepta GSC? So if I have a patient who's undergoing a navigational bronchoscopy, uh, all I treat is adults, so I don't have to worry about age, but it's over 21. And if they've smoked at all in their life, so essentially 100 cigarettes, which is at all, uh, at least here where I am, um, and they don't have any history of cancer, uh, my respiratory therapists um, have the brushes ready to go uh, before I even put in the scope. Um, it's just part of our standard workflow, um, and everybody in the room knows about it. I actually um, uh, incorporate it into my case request. Um, so when I'm entering a case request for my patient, I'll type in, Flex Bronc with uh, navigation, EBUS, and Percepta. Um, that way, everyone's on the same page. Um, it creates some redundancy so that I don't forget, so that my respiratory therapists uh, don't forget. Um, so it's part of my order. It's part of my standard workflow, um, and my RTs will prompt me um, at the beginning of pretty much every navigational case. Great. And then the last question we have for you today, Dr. Herman, is how many tissue samples are required with Invisia? For Invisia, um, again, it's just five transbronchial biopsies, uh, three from the lower lobe, two from the upper lobe. Um, so uh, the only tissue that you need is just a standard transbronchial biopsy, the same kind that you've been collecting since fellowship. Um, you're not doing anything different. Uh, they are easy to obtain. Um, we've been, you know, obtaining transbronchial biopsies and pulmonology uh, for a long, long time. Um, uh, I think we're up to 70 years now or so uh, since the flexible bronchoscope was uh, was um, introduced and allowed us to do this. Um, and so, five transbronchial biopsies, nothing special. You don't need cryobiopsies, you don't need a surgical biopsy, you don't need a trans thoracic needle aspiration, just five simple transbronchial biopsies using whatever forceps you normally use. Great, well, I think that is all the questions we have. Is there anything else that you would like to add, Dr. Kerman, at this time? No, um, I think that we covered a lot of good information. Um, I highlighted, you know, two pioneering tests. Um, there's really, you know, nothing else like them. Um, they're instrumental uh, in my practice uh, and in my institution's overall workflow. Um, I have no doubt that they will um, enhance anyone's program um, who incorporates them, and incorporating them is very, very simple. Um, I would encourage uh, um, uh, anyone who is who is interested in them to get in touch with their local Verisite rep. Uh, and there's no uh, kind of process that you need to go through um, because these are send out tests. You can literally just start doing it. Um, and I promise, um, if you you know start using tests like this, it's going to change how you view these different conditions and your workflow, and you'll see the value in it. Um, it's kind of self-explanatory. Um, or self-evident, I should say. Um, and with that, I just want to, um, again, thank the SAB um, and thank Verisite. Um, I hope everyone um, enjoyed the information that was presented. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me through the company. Um, I'd be happy to provide any more insight or guidance um, if folks need it. Um, but uh, I hope everyone has a great evening.
Thank you, Dr. Kerman. Um, yes, we will wrap things up now. Thank you everybody for attending. It was a great informative lecture. We want to thank our commercial sponsors of Verisite and Dr. Kerman on the behalf of the SAB. And we hope to see all of you at our next webinar. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be up on the SAB website so you can review um, within the next week or so. And thank you to everyone for joining and have a wonderful night.